Thank you for inviting me to speak. My name is Derek Watson and I'm a dentist. I qualified in 1982. Now, by dentist I mean a dentist in general practice that does general dentistry on the general public. I chose generalism as my specialism. Although I work in the private sector, I am affected by the lack of NHS dentistry because private dentists often provide an emergency service for patients who are in pain and unable to find an NHS dentist. We do a lot of this work on a pro bono basis. We do it because it's right and because we can pass on the cost to our other patients who support the work we do. In this presentation I'm going to give you a whistle stop tour of where we are, how we got here and finally make some suggestions about how to fix things. In 1981 when I qualified dentistry was provided almost exclusively on the National Health Service. This is a picture of a very young me at the start of my career sorting out my floppy disks. You could go to any dentist and get NHS dentistry and it would be done quickly and it would be of reasonable quality and I'll come back to quality later. There were a few private dentists for those patients who wanted bragging rights about the cost of their crowns down the golf club. In a few years when I retire the situation will be the exact opposite. Most dentists will be private with only a few working on the NHS. The three factors I have identified as creating dental deserts are number one, a Soviet socialist style micromanagement and centralization, groupthink and lack of pluralism leading to lack of innovation and also ineffective oversight by the Commons Health Committee. Number two, is a failure to recognise the competition posed by the free market in dental services, in particular the value of the subsidy provided by each dentist represented by the difference between the NHS fee and the free market price. Government interference can distort activity for a long time, but the market always reasserts itself. And thirdly, inclusion of dentistry into the inspection and testing regimes of much larger and riskier health providers such as hospitals, prisons, ambulance trusts, etc., greatly adding to the cost of compliance which has to be recouped. But first let's go back a bit. I must be one of the first dentists who is going to retire and be able to say that I have left the nation's oral health in a worse state than it was when I qualified, and it's not through a lack of trying. Yet during this period, from 1980 to the present, Dentistry has been run by a bunch of people who said that they were committed to ensuring NHS dentistry of a high standard is available to all. The NHS had a strong inspectorate of dental reference officers or regional dental officers. As they were mostly local dentists, they knew which dentists were good and who was a bit dodgy. They could sniff out BS and had a vested interest in maintaining public confidence in the system. Shortage of NHS dentists wasn't an issue. In fact, the problem that the government was worrying about was that the fee-for-item system was producing too much work. So much so that in 1986 the government commissioned the Shansheaf report, which told them something the Treasury didn't want to know, that dentists were earning large sums of money and pretty honestly. These same people will still tell you today that there is no problem. You can still get NHS dentistry, it's just that you may have to wait a bit longer or travel a bit further to get it. Now I know that's not true, and the patients know that's not true. Put your hand up if you think that's true. Actually, don't bother. This is a recording and I can't see you. You know it's not true. A recent BBC survey found that 90% of practices were unable to take on new NHS patients. Why was it left to the BBC to do this research? Even NHS England admits that only 34% of adults saw an NHS dentist in the two years to March 2022, compared with 49% in the previous comparable period, which was before COVID, so don't start thinking this is due to COVID. And the BDA says that NHS treatments are down by a third compared to the average of the five pre-pandemic years. So where did it all go so wrong? I'm going to invite you to consider dentistry in a different way. Think of it like any complex system, like a railway shunting yard for example. If all of the switches are set perfectly, then the trains get to their destinations and goods and services flow. But if you've got someone in the signal box who doesn't understand the switches, or is setting them incorrectly for ideological reasons, 
or is just switching the lines at random to see if something works, then you get a train wreck. Dentistry is used to being sidelined. We've gone from being on a par with doctors to being just another of the ancillary services. I happen to think that dentistry is the most important clinical area in the National Health Service. So why is dentistry so important in the context of the NHS? It's because dentistry is a simple proxy for healthcare in general. There are only three things that go wrong with teeth. One, everybody eats more sugar than they're prepared to admit. This causes tooth decay. It's a disease of children and young people. Two, nobody brushes as well as they think they do. This causes your gums to shrink and your teeth to fall out, so you need dentures. This affects older people, but it needs to be prevented while you're young. Three is everything else. But there isn't much else once you've taken out a few wisdom teeth and the very rare genetic abnormalities. If you could prevent dental disease, then you could apply that knowledge to say heart disease or obesity or diabetes. And if you could get costs down by improving health in dentistry, then you could roll out that system across the NHS. So let's have a look at a few dental basics. One question is whether we should have a basic system available to everyone or a better funded system targeted only at people in greater need. I think the answer is a better funded system targeted only at people in greater need. This is because if you spread the money too thinly, nobody gets a good service. But if you ensure a quality of access, a sort of there but for the grace of God system, you don't break the social compact by which you collect universal national insurance. It's the difference between equality of access, which we can achieve, and equality of outcome, which we can't. The arguments against this are that people won't pay their NI towards a system that they're not eligible to use, but they would be eligible to use it if they qualified for it, which is good enough for most. Some people might say, why should I pay if I can't use it? That's a bit like saying, why should I join the AA if I'm not entitled to be towed away, whether I need it or not? Is a fee for item service or a capitation service better? Well, this is a trick question. But remember that Shanxi found that fee for item was efficient and honest, providing you had a strong inspectorate. Capitation encourages supervised neglect, so it's better if you get rid of the inspectorate, which is what the government did. While I'm on the subject, let's have a look at what else the government has done in my lifetime. Something you hear quite often is that more money for wages is less money for treatment. We're hearing this in education, where school governors are saying that they just don't have the money to pay what the teachers are asking within the fixed school budgets. Why should patients go without dentistry when dentists are paid hundreds of thousands of pounds a year? It helps to think of the wages budget and the treatment budget as separate. They should both be adequately funded. Dental treatment provision is expensive. When I started sending in submissions to the review body on doctors and dentist remuneration, dentists were in the top decile of earnings. This is because dentists need academic, manual and business skills. Take a few seconds to think of another job that requires all three. Even a brain surgeon only requires two of these. Let's have another example. Supposing you commission someone to provide treatment to 100,000 patients for £100,000. After six months that person comes back and says either that the treatment has turned out to be more expensive than anticipated or that 150,000 patients needed treatment so can you have some more money to finish the job. You're quite within your rights to say that your objective was to treat as many people as possible within the 100,000 you had allocated and that the provider cannot unilaterally alter the contract and, and there is no more money. From 1947 to 1992, NHS dentistry worked very well. But first I need to clarify something. In 1947, the government made doctors into employees but dentists stayed on as self-employed subcontractors. So it's ironic that during the heyday of the National Health Service provision, all dentists were actually private. It was only in 2006 when NHS dentistry was nationalized and became a commission service that dentists stopped subcontracting to the National Health Service. So we've been private all along. 
In 1992, the government decided that micromanagement would improve productivity while keeping costs under control. Big mistake. They bumped up patient charges and cut fees, yet somehow, inexplicably, that made the situation worse. Responsibility for dentistry, which was initially with the Secretary of State for Health, got shunted down the chain of command until it reached Rosie Winterton, whose dental qualification was that she had once been a press officer for the Royal College of Nursing. Winterton was the last in a long line of ministers who had struggled to micromanage dentistry and they were fed up with patients complaining to their MPs and pictures of people queuing in Scarborough. So responsibility went down further to the unelected chief dental officer and up to banker and unelected hereditary peer Frederick Richard Penn Curzon, 7th Earl Howe, at which point there was no democratic route to salvation. In 2006, Winston, Cockcroft and a civil servant called Chris Audrey, with assistance from the British Dental Association, completely threw the baby out with the bathwater and introduced a system I call the Three Bears Porridge, or the UDA. Dentists were paid the same fee for one filling as for ten. They were paid the same for a quick and easy extraction as they were for a lengthy and technically difficult root treatment that could save a tooth. The nation's teeth were doomed. Then things went from bad to worse. In 2020, the Chief Dental Officer, Sarah Hurley, who had been left in charge by the Fat Controller with instructions to feed the dog but don't touch the switches, shut down every dental practice, even though it wasn't necessary and she had no authority to do that. The NHS practices were quite pleased because they got full pay for staying at home. In any case, they didn't want to jeopardise their NHS contracts by trying to treat patients if the CDO had told them not to. You may wonder how I can say this because very few dentists would be prepared to criticise the NHS in this way. As a dentist with 40 years under my belt working in the private sector, fortunately I don't suffer from the chilling effect that keeps so many NHS dentists from speaking up. Anyway, the private practices didn't get any pay, so as soon as they realised the Chief Dental Officer was acting ultra-virus and could get the personal protective equipment, they reopened. NHS patients were demanding treatment. Practices were handing out antibiotics like Smarties, antibiotic resistance be damned. But the Chief Dental Officer had made them pinky swear not to take advantage of the situation by offering private dentistry to NHS patients. Inadvertently, she had started the biggest private conversion scheme in history, funded entirely by the National Health Service. Dentists are overwhelmed with government micromanagement, most of which is just plain wrong. Take fluoride as an example. When I qualified, fluoridation was the responsibility of central government. When it became clear it was impossible to introduce fluoridation nationally, responsibility was devolved to local authorities. After all, Surely someone would follow Birmingham and introduce it. They tried in Southampton, but both Hampshire County Council and Southampton City Council opposed the scheme. So now they've given up doing it locally and taken on the job nationally. It's come full circle. Talk about the definition of madness. Another example of muddle thinking is antibiotic prophylaxis. Dentists used to prescribe antibiotics to patients at high risk of heart disease before extractions, but NICE vetoed this, although it remains the practice in the US and Europe and elsewhere. Some people might say that NICE was established to cut the NHS drugs bill. I couldn't possibly comment. In 2022, the biggest ever study in the United States said that dental extractions are responsible for up to 45% of all post-operative heart infections. I can see how nice is valuable to the government. I just can't see how it's valuable to the patients. Lastly, the Care Quality Commission is an unnecessary, expensive and burdensome inspectorate for dentists. In 2014, the biggest recall in the NHS's history was over a dentist, Desmond DeMello. It was alleged that his cross-infection control was inadequate and 22,000 patients were called in for testing. Of those, 4,500 patients came forward and five were found to have hepatitis C. This is much less than the 45 cases you would expect from the general population. So whatever DeMello had been doing, it wasn't infecting his patients. 
The lawyers at the GDC insisted on prosecuting an empty chair and trousered £125,000 for a nine-day hearing. But that's not the point. The point is that before de Mello was dobbed in by a disgruntled member of staff, he had an inspection by the Care Quality Commission which gave him the all-clear. So, in conclusion, as Ken Weech, MP for Ipswich and Parliamentary Advisor to the Dental Practitioners Association said, the government is like the farmer who decided to save money by every day feeding his horse very slightly less. This was a policy that worked very well until one day the horse died. There is no dental desert, there is just a lack of dentists who want to work on the NHS. Faced with the choice of an environment of constant micromanagement and meddling, centralisation, conflicting and constantly changing advice from the statutory bodies, a health select committee that is powerless and under the threat of summary closure from some clueless ex-dental nurse who's been promoted to CQC inspector, NHS dentists have signed up for the Sarah Hurley conversion course which enables them to build the private side of their practice with no financial risk. Dentists have opted for more autonomy and the ability to set fees by agreement with their patients, leading to greater time available, quality of materials and quality of laboratory work. NHS dentists work down to a price, whereas private dentists work up to a standard. What are my suggestions for reversing the decline in NHS dentistry, apart from going back in a time machine to 1982? Firstly, I would revert the job of the Chief Dental Officer from the government's representative to the profession back to being the profession's representative to the government. As Lord Acton said, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. One unelected person cannot be allowed to experiment with the dental service. Dentistry needs to be the responsibility of a Minister of State who is democratically accountable. Secondly, I would constitute a round table of all the talents to put policy suggestions to the Minister, including representatives from policy groups, practitioner groups and patients. The British Dental Association is not fit for this purpose since it benefits from Department of Health patronage and as a result is all bark and no bite. The local dental committees might be suitable as the Dentist Policy Forum but currently their resolutions are passed to the British Dental Association which discards them. Thirdly, there has to be a bonfire of all the inspection and testing requirements that add so much to patient charges for smaller practices. Before the Care Quality Commission was invented, before steriliser certification and pressure vessel inspections and X-ray protection advisors and Legionella testing and giving patients birth certificates for their dentures, dentistry used to work just fine. The reason was because dentists took responsibilities for all of that. Other health services do not have a person at the heart of the team who takes full responsibility like dental practices do. The war on dentists has to stop. We are wasting dentists' time demonstrating compliance when they should be doing dentistry. Lastly, I would like to recognise that dentistry is a service and it is provided in the free market. Any solution is going to involve part public and part private funding. This system works very well in other countries and was suggested to the Department of Health as early as 1992. There are safeguards to ensure that dental care is available to anyone who does not or cannot afford to contribute and the money saved can be recycled into better care for the disadvantaged. I've covered a lot of ground here and I hope that wasn't too confusing. I'm happy to provide any follow-up information that you might need, including a copy of this presentation, and you're welcome to contact me at the email address on screen. Thanks for watching.